Good afternoon. Thank you for joining me wherever and where, whenever you are, and to our collaborators in the Cincinnati Opera for sharing their virtual platform. First, let me introduce myself. Here I am in the top left corner. My name is Rebecca Howell. I am also a doctor, a surgeon, a director, a chief, a mother, a wife, a daughter, and a sister, amongst many other identities. I have the distinct pleasure in welcoming you back. My team and I have a wonderful program in a Pecha Kucha format. It is exactly as it sounds, quick and to the point, so that we can maximize our time together by showcasing some of Cincy's top talent. We are here today to share in a united love by celebrating together, not just as a community, a city, or a country, but with our colleagues across the world. This World Voice Day, we honor those we have lost to a pandemic that ravaged the world. We cherish those left behind, and we lift up our voices in awe of the challenges we've already overcome. Flashback to March 2020, when for the first time in our history, we all paused, we held our breath, and then we could hear nothing but our breath. The sadness that swept us as we learned of super spreader events and the crushing reality that live performance, religious ceremony, graduations, and social gatherings were no longer safe. In the ensuing months, we learned that SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 was a highly contagious and transmissible virus, most often spread in droplets in the breath. We learned new phrases like social distancing. We bought all the hand sanitizer and toilet paper we could find, and then every seamstress took to creating masks. And then we ran out of protective health gear, and we held our breath. But in the chaos was opportunity. In the beginning, when we first started to wear masks, there was a learning curve for all of us. In order for us to continue to take care of patients, we had to learn quick. Each week brought new questions, new protocols, and new challenges. We partnered with the VSM Lab, and today you will hear from Dr. McKenna and Renee on how masks affect the voice from the user perspective. Likewise, the Laryngeal Biomechanics Lab took advantage of the stillness by accelerating publication. This effort led by Drs. Kosla, Oren, and Gutmark. Both these, no both these notable NIH-funded investigators were given the gift of time. From my own question regarding how do we get our performers back on stage led to a fantastic adventure with my speech pathologist and my colleagues in the biolaryngeal mechanics lab. While our labs were busy, our clinics were quiet. Again, we recreated cleaning protocols, limiting exposures, and online learning. We used iPads and technology. We interfaced with telehealth and Zoom. We learned how to triage patients. When the, patient was at, when the question was asked, who needs a HEPA filter? My partner, Dr. Sedegat, answered the question, yes, we do. As we approached fall and the inevitable spike of cases, again, we waited. Now, instead of holding our breath, we focused on it. All of our patients with breathing problems came trembling into the office. We learned to breathe using N95 masks all day long as our practice was suddenly turned upside down. And then the operating room shut down. When patients finally came to see the doctor, it had already been months of symptoms. The cancers were bad. The non-COVID problems got worse. But there were moments we experienced the family reunions from the patients locked away in nursing homes that hadn't held or touched a loved one. And we were there as a witness the first sound of their voice saying, I love you, I missed you. Patients finally had access to the office, but now it had been months of surfing on the internet. I always warn my patients, if you know what you have, the internet is great, but if you do not, then you will be misled. It wasn't just the fear, but the disuse and the muscular wasting from not moving, not talking, not communicating. We encouraged patients to create a schedule, a pattern of movement, a regular phone call, in December, the first vaccines were given an emergency approval by the FDA. We were given a privilege, but we also took on the risk of the unknown. We took the vaccine because the fear of getting COVID was too great. The fear of spreading COVID was paralyzing. And then this cloud started to lift and we could see the light. Now things are not the way they were. We do not look the same. When you see us in the office, you will find us beneath both eye protection and masks, but know that behind these faces, we are smiling. We are so happy to see you again. But remember that we, like you, are vocal athletes and there is much work to be done. We are creating a new normal, but that's not a bad thing. My children have learned to wash their hands. Psst. So is my husband. Today, we will also hear from two more of Cincy Voice lovers on how we get back to business. Now that you have options, 
You can be seen in person or via telehealth. The silver lining of the pandemic is that telehealth will be here to stay and further break down barriers to care, be it financial or geographical. Blue skies are ahead. It wasn't only our physical bodies that were neglected, but our brains too. We were overloaded with information, how to negotiate unbiased knowledge from opinion. We will hear from a panel on mindfulness led by Dr. Kosa. Our very own Caitlin and colleague Darcy will be speaking to us from CCM on how to regain that breath we lost. It's never been so apparent to me than during this pandemic that the gift of voice as a, as a form of communication binds us when we are physically apart. We are here to support the real you today and the person you will become tomorrow. We welcome patients of all ages, backgrounds, and sexes, your true self and your honorary self. We will discuss today special populations from fitness instructors to healthcare workers, from children to professional vocalists. We will learn to care, support, and cherish the voice we were given. Our future is truly bright. My dear friend and mentor, Dr. Bob Sadaloff, has given us a tour de force on how we begin to think about opening up, but in our enthusiasm, we are challenged to continue to keep our friends safe. Exposure times and viral loads, God willing, will someday with vaccination be a thing of the past, but for now, let us be cautiously optimistic. I have had the great privilege of meeting both Miss Jessica Rivera and Miss Dan Steele, and I for one cannot wait to hear their personal and professional journeys as they share with us today on the elite vocal performance as a performer themselves, a coach, and a, cho and a choral director perspective. This is a true honor to share this virtual stage with both of these wonderful performers. One of the incredible fortunes we have had at the University of Cincinnati is to share in our common love of a very small organ, but one that is so powerfully connected to our human selves. The larynx or the voice box is our instrument for communication. We have shared in loss and fear, and today we rejoice in our bright future and our growing family. We welcome new members such as Dr. Kreckler and the gift of life and growing families to our great Cincinnati family. We are also most fortunate to present to you a listening party thanks to our partnership with the Cincinnati Opera. Without further ado, we thank you all for joining us in a celebration of One World, Many Voices from World Voice Day 2021. Welcome home, Cincinnati. Good afternoon. My name is Erin Donahue, and I am a voice pathologist and singing voice specialist in Cincinnati, Ohio. And I am so happy to have been asked to speak on gender affirmative voice and communication training today in honor of World Voice Day. I currently practice at Pro Voice Center in Cincinnati, Ohio, and the Blaine Block Institute for Voice Analysis and Rehabilitation in Dayton, Ohio. I work with all types of voice disorders, but my primary populations are both singing voice rehabilitation and gender diverse voice. Our voices communicate so much of who we are to others. Many characteristics of voice may signify gender. For transgender or gender diverse individuals, incongruence between their voice and their gender can increase feelings of dysphoria. Therefore, many of these individuals seek voice modification. For those who wish to modify their voice, and it's important to note that not everyone does want to modify their voice, some may do so independently with success. Others may wish to pursue medical management, especially in the case of masculinization, as testosterone can make some pretty significant changes in voice, or they may wish to pursue behavioral modification through therapy. In gender affirmative voice training, the goal is to aid the individual in modifying their voice in a safe and healthy manner to facilitate the individual's desired vocal outcome and provide vocal longevity. Therapists are able to provide tools and exercises to aid in discovering and developing an authentic voice for that individual. A gender affirmative therapy plan must be developed individually as one size does not fit all. Although two patients may both be seeking voice feminization, their idea of their goal voice may differ significantly. There are many aspects of voice which may or may not be addressed in treatment, including, but not limited to, pitch, resonance, intonation or prosody, articulation, language, nonverbal communication, and any specific voice-related symptoms or complaints that the patient may have. In the case of many transmasculine individuals, 
they may take testosterone, which can have some pretty significant effects on the voice. For these individuals, they often have lower pitch already, so therapy may have less focus on pitch and more focus on addressing potential symptoms such as vocal instability, vocal fatigue, or hoarseness. When many people think of voice and gender, they think of pitch. This is a major area that we work on in voice treatment, depending on the patient's goals and where their starting point is. During therapy, we determine the goal or target pitch, we explore pitch, and we raise or lower based on their goals, preference, and their comfort level. The resonance of voice is basically the filter, which shapes the sounds. Sound can really be changed through modifying resonance. We spend a lot of time on this in therapy, working on facilitation of efficient resonance, and also playing around with moving the resonance and seeing what kind of sounds that creates and what feels authentic for that patient. Prosody, or intonation, is basically the pitch variability. It's the ups and downs of speech that are kind of like your mountains and valleys. Depending on where we're going, whether we're feminizing or masculinizing voice, we may have more or less variability in our pitch. We also notice differences in speech patterns, such as connected versus staccato. We often work on changing the way that the patient articulates their speech. This can really help shape the overall sound, much like resonance, but in this case, we're shaping the speech by adjusting articulation patterns, changing the precision, and exploring different ways to shape speech, which results in an overall sound quality that's more towards the patient's goals. We know that there are some differences in language that are perceived by listeners as either more masculine or more feminine. Some patients may wish to address this area of communication in order to be perceived by outsiders as more of their gender. However, some people may not wish to pursue any modification of language as it's not authentic for them. Much like language, nonverbal communication also has variability in different styles that are perceived as more feminine or more masculine. This may be an area that a patient may wish to pursue modification in order to have overall communication or total communication that is much more in line with their gender. Once we're able to address every aspect of voice that the patient wishes to modify, we're able to play with the different aspects in order to shape an overall sound that is authentic for that patient and is congruent with their gender and how they wish to be perceived in the world and to others. When the sunlight strikes raindrops in the air, they act like a prism and form a rainbow. The rainbow is a division of white light into many beautiful colors. These take the shape of a long round arc with its path high above and its two ends apparently beyond the horizon. When the sunlight strikes raindrops in the air, they act like a prism and form a rainbow. The rainbow is a division of white light into many beautiful colors. These take the shape of a long round arc with its path high above and its two ends apparently beyond the horizon. When the sunlight strikes raindrops in the air, they act as a prism and form a rainbow. The rainbow is a division of white light into many beautiful colors. These take the shape of a long round arc with its pathway high above and its two ends apparently beyond the horizon. When the sunlight strikes raindrops in the air, they act as a prism and form a rainbow. The rainbow is a division of white light into many beautiful colors. These take the shape of a long, round arc with its path high above and its two ends apparently beyond the horizon. Thank you very much for listening today. Happy World Voice Day. Good afternoon. My name is Caitlin Reed. I'm a speech pathologist here at UC who specializes in voice. And I would like to talk to you guys about developing your voice brain. This is something that I think is hugely important if you're a professional who relies heavily on your voice. So let's go ahead and get started. This slide is just a little bit of review of what your throat looks like, in case it's been a little while since you've seen your vocal folds. There at the center of the picture, in the V, between your vocal folds is your trachea, 
And then at the very top of the picture in that little crease there is the entrance to your esophagus. Let's go ahead and watch some vocal folds in action. So now that you've been reminded of how they look and how they work, let's talk about what I mean when I say voice brain. I'm talking about having an awareness of your voice like you would naturally have about the rest of your body, reflecting frequently on how it's feeling, what it needs to do for you on a given day, and how you can best set it up for success. So using the word voice as an acronym, I'm going to share with you things that are helpful to focus on when you're using your voice brain. The first is volume. As you saw before, the vocal folds impact against each other when you make sound. The louder you are, the harder the impact. Being aware of your volume can help decrease trauma to the vocal folds. Like the rest of our bodies, our vocal folds have limits to how much they can do in a day. Be aware not only of how you are using your voice, but how much you are using it, and give it breaks when you can. We call these vocal naps. They can help the vocal folds recover more quickly when periods of heavy use are demanded. Unlike other musical instruments, our vocal folds are unfortunately subjected to the conditions of the body they reside in. Awareness of external factors like humidity or allergens, and internal factors like asthma or acid reflux, can give us insight into why our voice may be feeling or behaving differently than we expect, and allow us to make modifications necessary to improve our vocal outcomes. I'd like to say a little more about these two because allergies and acid reflux are two very common things people suffer from that can affect the voice. Regarding allergies, be aware that some allergy medicines can cause dryness, so avoid decongestants if possible and maybe try a sinus rinse instead. You can also try nasal sprays for postnasal drip instead of allergy tablets. Something not a lot of people are aware of is that you don't need to have heartburn to have acid reflux. If the reflux comes up high enough to hit your throat, it actually causes throat symptoms, which we call laryngopharyngeal reflux, and it can lead to a dry cough, hoarseness, throat clearing, all kinds of things that can affect your voice. If you think you might be suffering from acid reflux that affects your voice, here are some things you can do to help yourself out. Eat smaller meals. Don't eat three to four hours before bed. Take an antacid after meals and before bed. I personally recommend Gaviscon. And avoid eating too many acidic foods. Another environmental factor I'd like to mention is stress. Excess tension in the body can absolutely translate to the vocal folds. Our voices are very tied to our emotions. Just think about how hard it is to speak when you're about to cry. Vocal fold tension can also occur in response to throat irritation, when our bodies try to push through not feeling well and our voices ultimately pay the price. Something else to think about with your voice brain is what you can do proactively to keep your voice in good shape. We've already covered a few, for example, taking breaks from speaking when we have heavy vocal loads and watching how loudly we use our voice each day. But just like there are exercises you can do to condition your body, there are exercises you can do to condition your voice as well. One such exercise is a semi-occluded vocal tract exercise. An easy way to do this is to blow bubbles into a cup of water with a straw while making sound. You want to keep the bubbles going consistently and feel for the sound you're making to buzz at your lips. This ensures you're using good airflow for voicing and helps you keep your sound resonant in the front of your face. Speaking of resonance, learning to speak resonantly can be helpful too. You can work on this by using a hum to feel sound vibrations occurring on the front of your face. You can then build on this hum by working into syllables and words and eventually sentences. For example, my mom may marry Marv. My mom may marry Marv. As important as a good workout is a good recovery strategy. We all know about the benefits of vocal rest. But did you know that rest combined with humming can be even more healing? After an intense vocal engagement, rest your voice from speaking, but hum for four minutes every half hour or so. This will help decrease inflammation while also decreasing the chance your voice will feel stiff afterwards. Last but not least, don't forget to check in with the condition of your voice throughout the day. How will you know if your voice is up to the challenges ahead if you don't take time to touch base and reflect on it? Be sure to care for and be attentive to your voice the same way you would for the rest of your body. So to fully engage your voice brain, be attentive to how much you're using your voice and how loudly, 
Think about the environment your voice is in, both external and internal, and take steps to address what you can. Try not to wait until your voice needs help to get it into good shape. Use exercises to keep up good form. And don't forget to check in with your voice frequently to keep track of the condition it's in. A few other helpful tidbits are to avoid clearing your throat, which roughs up the vocal folds. So try using a or a silent instead. Avoid all forms of smoking, which can irritate the larynx, and try not to get too dehydrated as the vocal folds need lubrication to work well. And don't get sucked into these myths. While teas and lozenges may feel nice in the throat tissue, they won't ever touch your vocal folds as that would result in you choking, so don't rely on them to fix your voice. Foods and drinks won't touch your vocal folds either, so you can forgo those greasy potato chips people swear by. You should also avoid whispering when resting your voice as this actually increases strain and tension in your throat. Thank you so much for joining me for this quick blast about how to develop your voice brain. Of all the things I tell my professional voice users, awareness of good vocal health behaviors and hygiene are key. As much as we may wish our vocal folds were made of steel and indefatigable, they just aren't. But if you take good care of them and learn their limits, they'll do the best by you that they can. Hello everyone, my name is Lauren McHale and I'm one of the voice pathologists at UC Health. I want to shed some light into a special population in need of vocal help that is near and dear to my heart. Let me start by asking, have you ever attended a class like this? If you've attended any sort of group fitness class, strength training, spin, Zumba, bar, yoga, Pilates, you may have had many thoughts including, is this over yet? Why did I sign up for this? Who actually enjoys this? Right? That inner voice in your head trying to carry you through the workout. But have you ever thought about the voice behind the instructor? Fitness instructors are tasked with commanding a room instructing a large group of people to engage in organized exercise over loud music and competing background noise, including stationary bikes, treadmills, and weights for usually 30 to 90 minutes nonstop. These trainers are not only required to shout nonstop for an extended period of time, but they are expected to have clear, articulate, convincing, and powerful voices. They should also be easy on the ears. A voice can be distracting to the exercise experience if it is muffled or hoarse. Still, the job descriptions of this population rarely emphasize the use of voice. Globally, group fitness has run rampant over the past 10 years. The $30 billion health and fitness industry in the U.S. continues to grow by at least 3 to 4 percent every year and doesn't show any signs of slowing down now. Current research states that group fitness instructors are more closely linked to the prevalence of phonotraumatic injury and having symptoms of hoarseness. In fact, the New York Times published an article just last year pertaining to the increased risk fitness instructors possess of sustaining a vocal fold injury. Why is this? For many, fitness instructing is a full-time job requiring an average of around 15 classes per week, some starting as early as 5 a.m. Hello, morning voice. Many lead several classes back to back with almost no breaks in between. For others, it's a part-time job and considered added voice use in addition to daily speaking demands. Fun fact, I double as a cycling instructor with 10 years of experience and I know firsthand the dangers of voice abuse while teaching a fitness class. Let me show you a snippet of one of my 45 minute spin classes. Personally, my friends and I have experienced vocal strain and fatigue from teaching with broken amplification systems or no microphone at all. I've had friends in this industry who have experienced trouble with hoarseness, have to repeatedly cancel classes, and are lacking the ability to project and perform like they used to due to limitations on their voice. 
At UC Health, our laryngology team consisting of a laryngologist and speech language pathologist who specialize in voice can perform a video stroboscopy to evaluate your vocal cords, visualize your anatomy, see how it's working, and make a plan of care best suited to help improve your voice. Treatment may include surgery by one of our own fellowship trained laryngologists or therapy with our voice pathologists. The combination of treatment modalities best suited to treat you will focus on optimizing your voice, reducing vocal fatigue, maximizing vocal efficiency, and refining your vocal instrument to be in the best shape possible. Here's an example of a group fitness instructor treated here in our clinic. This 39-year-old female Pilates instructor complained of a tired and strained voice for the past eight months. She also had difficulty reading to her children and singing in upper ranges at church. She did not use amplification while teaching, but her class sizes were small. She ended up needing both a surgery to remove the polyp on her right vocal fold and post-operative voice therapy to ensure she was using her voice properly both in and out of her classes. Here you can see the lesion on the right vocal fold, which is on the left side of the screen, and postoperatively on the right, you can see this edge is now smooth and straight. As a Pilates instructor teaching about 15 hours a week, I was struggling to project during classes. After a successful surgery to remove a polyp and working with my voice therapist, Lauren, I found a plan that worked best for me. Both the surgery and therapy I received through UC Health have allowed me to continue my job without any concerns, and I never worry if I won't have enough voice. Outside of clinic, we are actively involved in research on studying the effects of group fitness instruction on the voice. Specifically, our published research has focused on the acute effects that teaching has on the laryngeal appearance and the acoustic and aerodynamic properties of the voice. Current research from our institution is delving into which specific voice therapy exercises prove to be the most effective for group fitness instructors to use in their daily life and aid them most during teaching. We hope to provide a protocol that can directly help their voice while instructing. At UC Health, we aim to raise awareness towards the vocal dangers fitness instructors possess, make a lasting change to improve the quality of their voices and the longevity of their career so they can continue to serve in our community and ultimately prevent injury for instructors to come. Thank you. My name is Dr. Aaron Friedman, and I'm a laryngologist and laryngeal surgeon at the University of Cincinnati. This being the only surgical talk of our series, my goal of this presentation is to give you a who, what, why, and how of vocal cord surgery, all without grossing you out and all in just over six minutes. When one thinks of vocal cord surgery, there is sometimes concern and trepidation on the part of vocalists, particularly amongst singers. Many instantly recall what happened to famed singer Julie Andrews, who had surgery to remove vocal cord nodules more than 20 years ago. But the media has also popularized many stories of successful vocal cord surgeries in singers over the past several decades. How is this possible? I'll tell you in two words. Millimeters matter. Precision is key in performing successful vocal cord surgery, but more about that later. First, let's get back to the who of vocal cord surgery. Who needs it? Typically two groups of people. Those who use their voice a lot as a result of their personalities, their occupations, or both and those that are not necessarily high volume voice users but happen to develop a disease process affecting the vocal cords just like any other part of the body. Let's talk about the first group of patients who may need vocal cord surgery, those who use their voices a lot. In medicine, we have a term for this, phonotrauma. We are all born doing it, some of us never stop, and very few of us get paid a lot of money to continue doing it. The vocal cords, as pictured in the high-speed video on the right of the screen, collide into one another very quickly during sound production. 
In one study of school teachers, this measured out to 750,000 collisions in men and 1.5 million in women over an eight-hour day. Singers may have even higher vocal demands. Heavy voice users are more prone to develop structural problems on the vocal cords. Here are three of the most common types in which surgery may play a role. Vocal cord nodules, a vocal cord polyp, or a vocal cord cyst. All are focal lesions which distort the otherwise straight vocal cord edges. Surgery can also help patients with diseases that affect the vocal cords but aren't necessarily caused by high levels of voice use. Three archetypal examples are papilloma or warts, vocal cord precancer, and vocal cord cancer. Normal voicing requires at least two things, vocal cords that close completely during a portion of the vibratory cycle and vocal cords that are soft. Here is a color tura soprano with a left vocal cord polyp and associated bleed before surgery. After surgery, both vocal cord closure and pliability are markedly improved, restoring her singing capabilities. Here is another example of a surgery I performed on a patient with vocal cord papilloma. After surgery, his vocal cord closure and pliability and thus voice are greatly improved. And now, how to perform vocal cord surgery in seven slides or less. This is most precisely done under general anesthesia in the operating room. Once a patient is completely asleep, a surgeon places a specialized lighted metal tube called a laryngoscope through a patient's mouth to directly view their vocal cords, as shown here by the green arrow. A variety of delicate micro-instruments, including scissors, suctions, probes, forceps, and sometimes lasers are then placed through the laryngoscope. While the business ends of these instruments are diminutive, their handles are almost a foot long in order to reach from the mouth all the way to the vocal cords. Vocal cord surgery is performed with the surgeon seated and looking through an operating microscope with his or her arms and wrists fully supported. Otherwise, a tiny movement or tremor of the arms or hands can produce massive movements at the working end of the microinstruments, risking inaccurate surgery on the delicate vocal cords. To appreciate the scale of vocal cord surgery, here is the surgeon's view through an operating microscope. The size of this singer's right vocal cord polyp was less than 4 millimeters, yet it was causing her significant singing difficulties, much like a pebble in one's shoe can be very noticeable. Hence the subtitle of this presentation, Millimeters Matter. Here is the same singer's surgery. An incision is made next to the polyp, and the hemorrhagic portion is isolated in a small flap away from the delicate vibratory layer next to it. Next, a specialized laser that targets blood vessels but is safe enough not to poke a hole in the flap is used to eliminate the blood supply to the polyp. Now, small cup forceps can be used to debulk the polyp from the delicate microflap without the bleeding that would otherwise occur without the use of the laser. The flap is meticulously thin to the thickness and transparency of a piece of saran wrap and ultimately trimmed and laid back down to provide a much improved focal cord edge. Finally, here is another surgical case of a patient with a left vocal cord cyst. After making an incision in the vocal cord, a fluid-filled cyst is carefully dissected and removed, leaving the deeper vibratory layers of the vocal cord undisturbed. The microflap is also preserved and laid back down to form a nice, straight edge. But as enjoyable and fulfilling as it can be to operate on the vocal cords when indicated, the real reward is in the restoration of voices and what that means to patients. I've had this problem five years, maybe a little bit longer, and the sound that I hear coming out of me is horrible. It's marvelous. I mean, everybody, everybody that I talk to, I mean, you know, your voice sounds so wonderful. You know, you, you just, you, you're doing so well. I'm pleased. And I, too, was pleased to have helped this patient regain her voice. It really is an honor and a privilege. Thank you.
Hello everyone, my name is Victoria McKenna and I am an assistant professor and director of the Voice and Swallow Mechanics Lab at the University of Cincinnati. I am pleased to present the first part of a two-part presentation on masks and vocal health. My talk will focus to begin, face masks are now an item that is part of everyday life. Just as you check to make sure you have your keys and cell phone when you leave the house, you also have to make sure you have your mask with you. Mask mandates are far reaching and include businesses and public spaces. Face masks are one precaution to reduce the spread of COVID-19. As we have seen in this video, when we speak, droplets and aerosols leave both the mouth and the nose. Talking without a mask increases the likelihood of viral transmission. A mask that is well fit over the mouth and nose reduces the spread of the droplets and aerosols. Therefore, it is critically important that everyone wear face coverings during community outings and more specifically while speaking to one another. However, people don't always wear their masks correctly. Sometimes they even remove their masks entirely to speak. We suspected that masks were impacting the ability to communicate and leading to this mask removal, but no one had investigated how masks were impacting the speaker. We know that speech requires coordination between multiple subsystems within the body. These include the lungs as the power source to the voice, the larynx itself as a sound generator, and the entire vocal tract as a way to modify speech sounds and resonance. We wanted to know how does placing a barrier over the mouth and nose impact the subsystems of speech? And how are community workers who are now required to wear masks impacted by this barrier? We wanted to answer these questions to help with effective masked communication. To address these questions, we formed a collaborative team of investigators across UC. This included professionals from the College of Allied Health Sciences, College of Medicine, College Conservatory of Music, and UC Health. We received funding from the Center of Clinical and Translational Sciences and Training at UC. We then enrolled 22 mask-wearing healthcare professionals. These included physicians, speech-language pathologists, physical and respiratory therapists, and nurses, to name a few. We gathered information from them both before and after a typical workday in which they had to use verbal communication to meet their work demand. To capture a holistic view of the impact and challenges of mass communication, participants completed questionnaires and provided feedback on their vocal symptoms. They also completed acoustic recordings with and without a mask in place in order to understand how the speech sound is degraded from speaking through a barrier. Our results showed that first and foremost, communication through a mask is difficult. First, there is a loss of visual information when wearing a mask. Participants commented that they had difficulty communicating with patients who needed to lip read, such as those with hearing loss. Participants reported feelings of having to yell or increase their vocal volume when speaking through a mask. This is consistent with previous research that has shown that masks degrade signal amplitude by anywhere from 3 to 12 dB SPL, depending on the type of mask and speech frequency. Healthcare workers also experienced increased amounts of vocal effort, defined as feeling that they had to try extra hard to create a voice. Not only did we see a significant increase in effort during masked speech, but effort continued to be high at the end of the workday, even when the mask was removed. Workers also reported an increase in self-perceived dyspnea or shortness of breath during masked speech. Participants reported feeling it was hard to catch their breath sometimes throughout their workday. However, the degree of dyspnea was considered minimal. From this evidence, we concluded that dyspnea was not a major factor impacting our speakers. A common reason for poor mask adherence is reports of being unable to breathe through a mask. But we now know that the impact is slight or minimal in those who use it all day, every day. 
We also examined speech acoustics and determined that there was a significant reduction in spectral content in higher frequency ranges greater than 4,000 Hz. This finding was consistent with other work that has shown reduced spectral content. We believe this causes a muffling effect when speaking through a mask. Besides muffling, we found a significant reduction in vowel articulatory space measured via formants during the vowels a, ah, e, and u. Although we thought speakers would over-articulate, our work provided evidence of the opposite. Speakers exhibited reduced articulation, or what is referred to as mumbling. In summary, masks impact the subsystems of phonation and articulation. Participants exhibited increased vocal effort, a loss of high-frequency speech information leading to muffling, and a reduction in articulatory space leading to mumbling. Although some dyspnea was reported, it was deemed minimal. With this information we gathered, our next steps were to address the symptoms and challenges facing mask-wearing workers. During the second part of this talk, Renee Gustin will discuss vocal health strategies during masked communication and how to protect your voice throughout the day. Thank you for the opportunity to share our work with you. Please visit our website, bsmechlab.com, for more information about how to overcome speech and voice challenges during masked communication. Hi, my name is Christian Purcell, and I'm a bass baritone. As a classical singer, vocal health is of paramount importance to me. I'm thrilled to participate in World Voice Day, and I'd like to show you a little bit of how the classical voice works. In this case, I'll be singing Bella Siccome un Angelo from Donizetti's opera Don Pasquale. Pay attention to how my voice continues on a line, legato, and how flexible it is as it moves up and down. At the end, I do a cadenza, and you'll hear some coloratura, where the voice moves quickly up and down in my range. I hope you enjoy. Thank you. Yeah. 
Hello, my name is Renee Gustin and I'm a speech language pathologist within the ear, nose and throat department here at UC. I have had the honor of working closely with my colleague, Dr. McKenna on her masks and vocal health research and outreach initiatives. In this short presentation, I hope to pick up right where Dr. McKenna left off. In Dr. McKenna's presentation, we learned that masks do indeed add a barrier to easy and natural communication. Therefore, it is important to be proactive in keeping our voices healthy while still communicating effectively. She also discussed how communication challenges are driving people to remove their masks to make it easier to talk and be understood. In this presentation, I hope to help you identify whether or not you're having vocal trouble while communicating with a mask on. And I will provide strategies to help with these types of voice and communication issues. By utilizing these recommendations, I hope you will be less tempted to lower your mask when speaking. Do you have a voice or communication problem? Well, ask yourself these questions. If you answered yes, you may be having difficulty talking while wearing your mask. It is important to become aware of these signs. Learning to monitor each of these symptoms in yourself can help you prevent problems such as vocal fatigue from lingering or even starting in the first place. So without further ado, here are my recommendations. Masks create a barrier to sound. Mask wearers report that they have to speak loudly to be heard through their masks, but speaking loudly for long periods of time can lead to vocal fatigue, hoarseness, and other vocal problems. A personal amplification device can help you maintain a comfortable speaking volume. An amplification device is a small microphone that sits on the ears or pins to the shirt with a separate small speaker worn on the body. Consider using a microphone if you are speaking to large groups of people in large spaces or in noisy environments. The microphone amplification helps to increase your vocal volume and reduce vocal strain. Voicing requires the coordination of your mouth to articulate your voice box for sound and your lungs for air. Without proper alignment of these systems in the first place, you may experience vocal fatigue, muscle tension, and the feelings of breathlessness while speaking. Focusing on body posture and alignment, especially during these mask wearing times, can help you produce speech more easily and efficiently. It is important to maintain a relaxed and neutral position with your neck and shoulders and position yourself so that your ears are over your shoulders. And remember to take relaxed and deep breaths from your belly. Our research has shown that masks reduce our ability to articulate different sounds, making our speech sound mumbled. And this is because masks restrict the movements of your lips, jaw, and tongue. Instead of trying to increase your vocal loudness to compensate for these restrictions, one strategy you can use is over-articulation. Try to speak more slowly while over-pronouncing your speech sounds. Open your mouth widely and move the tongue and lips freely for each sound. Wearing a mask can really make it feel like you're constricted in your speech, but with practice and focus, you can control how clear your speech is. Hydration is integral to healthy voicing, but during this pandemic, drinking water can be more difficult than normal because you may not want to remove your mask. Try to keep a water bottle with a straw handy to remind yourself to continue taking sips of water over the course of a day. With a straw, you don't have to remove your mask entirely to take a sip. Remember, you should try to consume at least 64 ounces of water a day. In addition to drinking water, try to limit your daily consumption of coffee, teas, sodas, alcohol, and other dehydrating beverages. And for every dehydrating beverage that you do drink, you need to drink an additional glass of water. The muscles of the voice need a break just like any other set of muscles in the body. Just as we give our feet a break from walking, we should also give our voices a break. To ensure that you are not overusing your voice, try to schedule vocal naps throughout your day. Try setting alarms on your phone to remind you to take a vocal break. Try to observe 10 minutes of silence at least two to three times per day, or if possible, take a break from talking for about five minutes per hour. You can also use the time to check in with your voice and assess how it feels. Do you feel hoarse or tired? If the answer is yes, then you might need to implement more vocal breaks. 
Have you ever noticed that your voice tends to sound a little rough or groggy in the morning? Well, just like how we warm up the muscles of our body before exercising, your voice needs to be warmed up too. Warming up the voice before your day can help prevent the onset of vocal fatigue and hoarseness that can occur when using your voice over long periods of time. Now that we communicate through face masks, warming up the voice before a long day is more important than ever. One of the easiest ways to warm up your voice is to simply hum. Gently humming for three to five minutes can improve the quality of your voice and help the voice come out more easily and with a clearer and more consistent tone. All of this being said, if you have consistent symptoms of vocal fatigue, it is painful to talk over long periods of time, your voice is getting in the way of your job or your ability to communicate, or if you have been hoarse for more than two weeks, it is important that you seek out the care of an ear, nose, and throat doctor. In conclusion, here are the six strategies to assist in making masked communication easier for your voice. Microphone amplification, relaxed and aligned posture, clear speech, hydration, vocal naps, and vocal warm-ups. I encourage you to give them all a try and find the ones that work best for you. Thank you so much for joining me for this brief presentation. If you would like more info on our research or would like to access more in-depth educational modules on vocal health and communication strategies during this unprecedented time of mask wearing, please visit our lab website at vsmechlab.com. I'm grateful for the opportunity to share with you over the next few minutes my philosophy of teaching the singer how to find their whole voice. It is part vocal pedagogy, part psychology, and part meditation. It is all based on my personal experience as a voice student, professional classical singer, and voice teacher. Body, mind, spirit, voice. It takes the whole person to sing and rejoice. This is the teaching philosophy of the late Helen Kemp, who was a voice teacher, composer, founding member of the Choristers Guild, children's chorus clinician, and professor emerita of voice and church music at Westminster Choir College. She was also the grandmother of my late best friend, mezzo-soprano Kristen Rothfuss Erbst, who lovingly referred to Professor Kemp as Mama Helen. I first became aware of Mama Helen's teaching philosophy upon her passing in 2015 at the age of 97. As a gift for Kristen, I had her words made into the painting you Kristen displayed the painting in her voice studio, along with pictures of the people who inspired her to become a singer and a voice teacher. Mama Helen's philosophy has inspired many, myself included. Using her philosophy as a framework, I will now define and apply it as it pertains to my teaching practice. We begin with the body, which is the physical home of the three things that make singing possible. Number one, the breath, which is the support mechanism that brings life to the voice. Number two, the vocal mechanism, the larynx and the vocal cords, which give the voice its color and tone. Number three, the resonators, which amplify and project the voice. When a singer coordinates the well-supported breath with the other physical parts required in singing, the open throat, expanded nasopharynx, relaxed jaw, and relaxed tongue, one can produce a healthy, full, resonant sound. The coordination is key and requires time, effort, and extreme patience. While most singers share the basics of vocal technique, Learning to sing is very individual and very personal. The singer must work diligently with their teachers and coaches to understand, scrutinize, and supervise the coordination of their own uniquely beautiful instrument. Next, we consider the mind. I've heard Professor Kemp say that our mind is the means by which we help direct the body to do the thing we call singing. We use our intellect to help form the thoughts that direct the body to sing. In my experience, this can be simple and difficult at the same time. Simple because we can truly just tell our bodies what to do, to relax the jaw, relax the tongue, allow the breath to enter the body, and release the breath into sound. Difficult because our minds are often filled with thoughts and experiences, both positive and negative, which can make steering it in the right direction a monumental task. The body achieves what the mind believes. It is the discipline of the mind that results in the discipline of the body. So fill your mind with positive thoughts and affirmations about who you are and what you are doing. Speak life and truth over yourself, not death and lies. 
Make this a daily practice. Next comes the spirit. In the largest sense, spirit is the expression with which one sings. It is the ability to connect with the listener using the singing voice. It is said that dissemination does not equal communication. The spirit ensures that communication happens. As each individual singer lays their spirit over the music, they give their personal individual presence and demeanor based on their collective education and life experiences combined with their inspired imagination. The result received by the audience is the singer's expression of their spirit. The most powerful words ever spoken to me in this regard were by my beloved voice teacher, Nina Hinson, as I took my first lesson with her. She said to me, we can fix what's wrong with your voice. You need to heal your spirit. I'm so thankful God sent her to me to help me fix both my voice and my spirit. Finally, we have the voice. The voice is the gift each singer receives when they are knit together in their mother's womb. This gift, when partnered with the gift of life and all of its experiences, helps the singer discover and determine what they want to say with that voice. We have covered the four elements, body, mind, spirit, and voice, which make up the whole person according to the teaching philosophy of Professor Kemp. But what does it mean to truly be a whole person when it comes to singing professionally on the world stage, and how does a teacher prepare a student for such a task? In my experience, keeping the body whole in order to maintain the necessary stamina to perform at the professional level requires these key things. Excellent nutrition, regular exercise, and consistent sleep. Your body is a complex self-healing creation. Do right by your body and it will do right by you. A few years ago, when I was on a journey to heal my physical body, I was also encouraged to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. Just as we are what we eat, we are what we think. So I spent time learning positive affirmations to speak over myself and practical ways to process through past emotional traumas, as well as how to effectively communicate my thoughts and feelings. Healing the spirit requires taking the time to engage in regular self-care, something we often neglect to do. But when we take the time to check in with our spirit and remind ourselves of our divinely inherent value, we begin to take hold of our worth at a core level and begin to define ourselves less by the opinions of others. It goes without saying that good vocal health is key to good singing, but despite our best efforts to care for our voices, there will be times when we suffer vocal fatigue or trauma that is only helped by the excellent, earnest care of the medical professionals who make it their life's work to help us heal and return to the stage. What a blessing for a singer to have that kind of care. In the end, it is the singer who is diligent in the connecting, combining, and coordinating of the body, mind, spirit, and voice who finds his or her whole voice and is blessed to sing and rejoice. By the way, the singer in this photo is yours truly as Musetta in the 2017 Cincinnati Opera production of La Boheme. And yes, I am singing with my whole voice. Happy World Voice Day 2021. And welcome to my presentation, Pediatric Voice, Kids Voice the Darndest Things. My name is John Fredeking, and I am a speech therapist at CCHMC, where I work in our Center for Pediatric Voice Disorders, evaluating and treating pediatric voice disorders. A child is described as having a voice problem if the voice is distracting or unpleasant to listeners and is abnormal enough to interfere with communication. Between 1.4% and 6% of the pediatric population is diagnosed with a voice disorder. Among this percentage, vocal nodules are the most commonly diagnosed voice disorder. More than 1 million children have dysphonia. As you can see, the child laryngeal anatomy differs greatly from that of the adult. As a child grows, their laryngeal anatomy gets bigger. However, it is small during infancy and early years to protect the airway during the swallow function. Kids' voices change through puberty, most noticeably in males. Their larynx lowers, their vocal folds thicken and enlarge. Their voice can drop up to an octave in range. We also start to see a prominence of the Adam's apple. Within a female and their voice, 
Their larynx does lower, the vocal folds thicken and enlarge, but not as much as a male, and their minimal pitch drop is around three tones. Here is a great visual that shows you the length of the vocal folds. As you can see, between the ages of being a newborn up to age 10, the male and the female vocal folds are the same length. Starting between ages 10 and 20 is when we start to see that difference in the length with the males having the longer length in the vocal folds. Here at CCHMC, we have a Center for Pediatric Voice Disorders. It was established in 2004. We see over 300 patients annually. We've seen 2,500 patients to date. Our staff includes two pediatric otolaryngologists and surgeons and three SLPs and voice therapists. During a pediatric voice evaluation, there are three components. First is a thorough intake and case history about the history of the voice issue. Secondly, we take perceptual and acoustic measures of the child's voice. And lastly, we do imaging and we make recommendations for voice therapy. During the acoustic and the aerodynamic portion of the evaluation, we take into account the different parameters of a child's voice. For example, pitch, loudness, breathiness, airflow, and the pressure in the child's voice. Here you can see some of the instruments we use to take those measurements. Next, we do imaging, where we can see the child's vocal folds during the voicing. For children, we have two scope types that can be options. On your left, you'll see a rigid scope. It offers a very clean and precise picture of the vocal folds. And on the left, you will see a flexible stroboscopy where there is a camera inside the black tube. Each scope offers great information and we decide to do these based upon the child's ability to tolerate the scope. The scope is very important in making the differential diagnosis of the vocal fold pathology. Here, we're going to watch a normal set of pediatric vocal folds during the scope. Next, we will see still frames of a child's vocal folds. On the left side, you can see the abducted vocal folds where the vocal folds are open. And on the right side, you can see the adducted vocal folds when they are closed when a child is producing their voice. The most common voice disorder we see in the pediatric population are vocal fold nodules. They are callus-like bumps on the edges of the vocal folds. They are usually symmetrical and bilateral to each other. They have a great response to therapy. Even though they won't actually go away with therapy, the child can obtain a better perceptual voice with the vocal nodules on their vocal folds. The second most common voice disorder we see in the pediatric population are vocal fold cysts. These are lesions that are more within the muscle of the vocal fold. They can be bilateral or unilateral. They have a variable response to therapy. Some of these children end up undergoing surgery to remove them, but they have to be able to follow post-procedure vocal fold rest. Given good compliance and good practical expectations, pediatric voice therapy can be very beneficial to those children who have voice disorders. Their treatment plans should be very individualized to the child and not the disorder. Indirect therapy is a very important component of voice therapy. These would be things such as monitoring hydration, working on managing vocally abusive behaviors, and working with the family to help manage these vocal behaviors in their child. The next part of therapy will be direct therapy. These are going to be therapeutic tasks that help the child achieve an improvement in their perceptual voice given their vocal pathology. 
Most of the voice therapy techniques we use with the pediatric population are modified from those that are used with the adult population. Now I want to share with you pre and post recordings of a 12 year old boy who had vocal fold nodules. These are his sentences before he started therapy. The blue spot is on the key. How hard did he hit him? We were away a year ago. We eat eggs every Easter. My mama makes lemon muffins. Peter will keep at the peak. And these are his sentences following a course of voice therapy. The blue spot is on the key again. How hard did he hit him? We were away a year ago. We eat eggs every Easter. My mama makes lemon muffins. Peter will keep at the peak. So as you can hear, he obtained an improved perceptual quality in his voice, even though his post-therapy stroboscopy still revealed vocal fold nodules. To end, I want to say thank you to the Cincinnati Opera and to the Department of Otolaryngology at UC for allowing me to talk to you about pediatric voice therapy. I'm very hopeful that for World Voice Day 2022, we can all be together. Good afternoon. My name is Danielle Cozart Steele, and thank you so much for attending my session with World Voice Day. I'm the Artistic Director of the Cincinnati Young Professionals Choral Collective, and today I'm here to tell you about some of the creative programming we did in response to COVID-19. Let me contextualize myself a little bit. I'm a music educator with a background in choral conducting and private voice teaching. I work in academia. I'm a researcher into transgender singing voice pedagogy and doctoral student at Columbia University in New York City, in addition to being the artistic director of the Young Professionals Choral Collective. The Young Professionals Choral Collective was founded nine years ago by Kellyanne Nelson and has grown from a 40 member choral ensemble that started in the basement of a bar with some people who just wanted to make excellent music and meet friends. It caters to young professionals from ages 21 to 45 who want to make high quality choral music and have a wonderful time while also creatively engaging with their community. I took over YPCC as their artistic director just as the pandemic started in 2020. In times of great strife also comes great innovation. This proves true historically for music. In Europe and the US post-World War II, at the same time, musically occurring, Miles Davis was producing The Birth of Cool, John Cage was writing his piano sonatas, Strauss was composing the four last songs, and Boulet was writing his second sonata. This type of musical innovation is born from situations which challenge humans' perception of their place in the world, and in this, there is opportunity. That is how YPCC approached the pandemic. It was time to get creative. In the first choral performance since the pandemic began, in mid-October 2020, YPCC took to the Purple People Bridge with almost 150 singers coming together to sing masked, socially distanced, and miked. We performed for an audience of about the same size and our singers were pumped through an FM transmitter. We broadcast into Newport and Cincinnati. You could enjoy us from on the bridge, along the banks of the Ohio, and up to a mile away on either side. To prepare for the Purple People Bridge Sing, we had to be able to meet and rehearse safely. While we did most of our rehearsals on Zoom, there is nothing quite like making music together in person. Following strict COVID safety protocols outlined by studies conducted by the University of Cincinnati and the University of Colorado Boulder, we were able to bring together our singers in the parking lot of the Warsaw Federal Incline Theater for two in-person rehearsals prior to the bridge sing. 
We also live streamed these rehearsals on our Facebook Singers Only page, and you can see in the upper right hand corner that there was a camera trained on me as I conducted. We had section leaders on microphones at all of these rehearsals as well, and we broadcast our rehearsals using the same FN transmitter. People could participate either in the parking lot or from their cars, again, up to a mile away. Going virtual means getting creative. In the lower right-hand corner, you can see my face as I'm dealing with logistical and tech issues during one of our first rehearsals. We learned about Wi-Fi versus Ethernet, microphone quality and camera resolution. However, if you look up in the upper left-hand corner, you can see a far more sophisticated setup. This involved multiple cameras, microphones, and devices for streaming so that singers could see me conduct from multiple angles, as well as have the benefit of a live accompanist, so it felt more like a traditional choral rehearsal that was responsive to singers in real time. When we couldn't be together physically, we found other creative ways to sing together. You can see in the upper right hand corner, we used the acapella app, which is available on iPhone and allows people to collaborate and layer tracks. In the lower left hand corner, you see one of our fabulous music captains who recorded rehearsal tracks for singers to use when we weren't in session. YPCC has always been a collaborative ensemble. We reached out to community partners who were otherwise not doing good business during the pandemic. And in a mutually beneficial relationship, we worked together. They provided us rehearsal space and we provided them with much needed patronage. The image you see here is of us at Carrick and Distillery on the east side. In the lower right hand corner, another of our partners, Humble Monk Brewing in Northside. And above that, you can see one of the fabulous charcuterie boards designed by Boards and Bees, and they delivered wonderful snacks to our singers during rehearsal. Colder temperatures meant that we didn't rehearse with the whole group outside, but at Christmas, after having been in isolation and quarantine for nine months, our singers were eager for connection and holiday traditions. We got small groups together to rehearse outside and then do caroling gigs around the city, and we produced a one-hour family-friendly holiday special that we broadcast in December featuring our singers and a lot of their pets. It was uniquely gratifying to witness all of the hard work of my singers culminating in this one hour special. We had a visit from Santa Claus, a reading of the night before Christmas, and a Christmas carol sing-along for our audience members led by the music captains of YPCC. YPCC's spring offering is our Nurture the Neighborhood concert at Season Good Pavilion at Eden Park this Saturday at 3 p.m. The concert is free and open to families and there is ample distance and safe seating. This will be the first in-person live choral concert with an audience in Cincinnati since the pandemic began and we are so excited to be returning to in-person singing. Thank you for attending this World Voice Day presentation. Please join us at our concert this Saturday and reach out if you'd like to be a part of the organization. You can learn more about us at ypccsing.org. Hi, my name is Darcy Smith, and this is a presentation on vocal extremes in video game acting. I'm a professor of voice and speech and acting at the University of Cincinnati CCM acting program and have been a professional voice coach for over 15 years. Most acting training really focuses on training the actors for the ideal. So we train them to be open in their sound, supported uh, on voice so it's not breathy or fry or constricted and that they have a resonant forward focus type of placement or sound. My own experience as an actor when I graduated from 
an excellent BFA program and excellent voice training did not entirely prepare me for the real world. Uh, having an open sound is great when you're doing Shakespeare monologues, but maybe not so good when you need to do a combat scene and scream or shout. The actor's working reality is that we're required to use our voice in stressful ways. And sometimes a damaged voice will be the one that gets the job because it's more unique. We might need to sustain that posture or sound for longer than we know how to do. And there's a real pressure on us not to complain about any injury. So when I became a voice teacher 15 years ago, I saw this need in the training that I was giving to my own students. So I experimented on myself and how to make these sounds. Uh, I borrowed techniques from Lessig, Fitzmorris, Linklater, Estill, and Ingo Titze, and more. And I began training staged combat actors in vocal combat techniques. So to give you an example of what is expected for a video game actor in an audition, they might have to do 15 very loud command barks. You might think like a drill sergeant. Uh, simulate getting shot, stabbed, stabbed in the throat, electrocuted, and then set on fire. And the truth is, there really is a need for this kind of training because the demands of the industry, they're not going to change. They haven't gotten more relaxed about what they demand from the actors. And this industry, the video game industry, is growing exponentially. So we need actors to be prepared for these kinds of events. Once I got to a place where I felt like I could replicate these sounds that were needed in stage combat, uh, I began training stage combat actors, uh, teaching them how to growl, grunt, scream, cough, choke, do battle cries, as well as teaching them about vocal fitness and how to recover in the middle of a scene, but also afterwards. While working with a group of stage combat actors, I was approached by a group of video game actors who wanted to know whether I could do a very similar thing for them. I teamed up with industry experts Kim Hurden and Simon Peacock and voice health experts like Caitlin Reed, as well as video game actors. You see, the problem was that stage combat actors, the sounds that they make, are not realistic or aggressive enough to be used in a video game. So I hired a video game director to help us find the target sounds and we reversed engineered the training so that we worked back from industry expectations. Once we had these target sounds and had created a system, we tested it out in a pilot study and it allowed us to create a systematic method to train actors for aggressive sounds. And we found that it reduces actor fatigue and improves recovery time as well as improving accuracy for the actor. We took a group of voiceover actors and we put them through a video game simulation. Then we trained them in VCT and had them go through the simulation again. And we found that nearly all of them had improved scores in their vocal handicap index and evaluation of ability to sing easily. Not only did they have improved results in terms of reduced fatigue and uh, increased recovery time, but we also found that they were more accurate in hitting the targets in terms of how the industry wants those sounds to sound in terms of aggressiveness and quality. So on the plus side, VCT actors have less fatigue, they're more accurate, and they recover faster. However, the thing to keep in mind is that most actors haven't been trained in these sounds, and so they have a greater chance of vocal fatigue, potential injury, and they're slower to recover from these sounds for the next day. The core elements of vocal combat technique training are creating a flexible instrument, uh, learning how to do those stressful behaviors in measured amounts, teaching them how to recover, and provide approaches to making the sounds without injury, and also learning how to do the specific effect needed and not incorporate other sounds. The four key principles for vocal combat technique are number one, vocal fitness training, making sure that they are in a vocally fit place. We value technique over using emotion. We teach them how to understand what the target sounds are, and we provide them with a systematic training approach. When I train video game actors, I take them through a three-step process. The first part really is that vocal boot camp, the vocal fitness, then vocal mechanics, teaching them how to use their voice in very specific ways. And then I take them through target practice where I teach them these are the sounds that you need to make uh, to get the job. 
As more and more actors are trained in vocal combat technique, we're seeing how it's actually rolling out in the industry. And so far, the feedback has been really good. Uh, they're finding that it is allowing them to go a little bit further into their recording sessions and recover faster. So what is the next step for vocal combat technique? Well, continued research on the benefits, but also how we can improve it but also beginning to see if we can find industry buy-in so that actors are trained before they record and that they understand the risks and demands of the work they're about to engage in. Thank you so much for listening. If you do have any more questions about vocal combat technique or voice and video games, you can reach me at darcy.smith at uc.edu. Thank you so much to all of the team at UC Health and especially Dr. Howell and Caitlin Reed for your help with the vocal combat technique. Hi, I'm Dr. Wendy LeBourne, and I'm excited to be here with you on World Voice Day. In the words of Lin-Manuel Miranda, the world turned upside down. I'm here to talk about the care of vocal athletes before it the life of every vocal athlete changed on March 12, 2020, when signs like this were posted on every Broadway theater across New York City. And by Sunday of this week, every national tour of every Broadway show had effectively closed indefinitely. Not since 9-11 had theaters closed in New York City, and not since the pandemic of 1918 had theaters closed across this country. At the time, we had no idea the economic, emotional, and physical toll it would take on the... By March 17th, we had learned that choral singing was potentially super spreading as one choral member in Saget County, Washington, resulted in 87% of the chorus becoming infected with SARS-2 COVID. In an effort to better understand the spread of COVID-19 in singers and vocal athletes, panels got together, research studies were developed to try to understand how and why we could sing effectively together or not during this pandemic. What we started to learn was that some athletes, both physical and vocal, were asymptomatic. Some became severely ill and passed away. And we had this group of outliers who became what we now know as COVID long haulers. While the vast majority of vocal athletes will fully recover within about two to four weeks of experiencing COVID-19, there is a subset of vocal athletes that months later continue to experience chronic symptoms of fatigue and breathlessness. Six months into the pandemic, studies had started to be conducted regarding the short and long-term impacts of those vocal athletes who had had COVID-19, how it was affecting them both physically and vocally so that we could return to a normalcy in vocal fitness. In a small study of elite vocal athletes pre and post COVID that I conducted and presented at a NATS meeting, we found that physical fitness and vocal fitness decreased significantly before and three months after having COVID. Within this same study, vocal athletes reported vocal concerns returning to singing after COVID-19 as being vocal fatigue, changes in dynamic range or power, and feeling physically weak and exhausted. A full year has passed since the emergence of COVID-19 and shutting down the theaters in New York City. Our focus has shifted with our vocal athletes to recovery and returning to performance, and with our long haulers, how to get them back to their pre- What does COVID recovery look like for vocal athletes? Well, the frank reality is it's as unpredictable as the disease has been itself. 
Unfortunately, each vocal athlete has experienced their own path to recovery, so we have to think outside the voice. As singing and speaking starts with breath, much of the COVID-19 recovery with vocal athletes has started with breathing exercises, specifically reestablishing breathing patterns and strengthening respiratory muscles to maximize. One of the biggest challenges with our vocal athlete COVID long haulers has been the significant inconsistency in their ability to recover. We have days when they are feeling totally normal and days when they go back to ground zero. But we must be positive and we must move forward because the voices of vocal athletes need to be heard. Our singing studios will forever look different, but our technology has allowed us to sing together in times when we are physically. Vocal athletes in the educational system have also learned to adapt during this time of COVID-19. We see singers, actors, dancers, instrumentalists, and teachers using masks effectively to be able to continue to we are starting to see the reemergence of live concert performance events. They may look a little different at this time with masks on faces, but for the first time in almost a year, we are able to enjoy the music provided by vocal actors. In the professional world, things are also going to look a little bit different. Each of these vocal athletes was COVID tested daily for the week prior to the performance and on the day of this performance. They rehearsed masked and sung the performance unmasked. Vocal athletes are recovering physically, vocally, and emotionally from this turbulent year that we have all had. It's exciting to think that the theaters may be filled again soon, at least at some capacity, for us to be able to enjoy live performance. In closing, what a year it has been. We've learned much about the human voice, resilience, passion, perseverance, and our love as a society of the arts. It's time for our vocal athletes to return to the stage so we can hear their voices once again. Hello, my name is Victoria Okafor and I am a soprano with Cincinnati Opera. As a singer, vocal health is very important to me, so I'm very excited to be participating in this year's World Voice Day. I will be singing Je veux vivre from Romeo and Juliet by Gounod as a way to demonstrate just one of the many ways that the voice can work. In this aria, Juliet is confessing to her nursemaid how she no longer wants to live this artificial life and how she just wants to live a life that she sees in her dreams. Hope you enjoy.
us. So, um, Victoria, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, uh, my name is Victoria Popritkin, and I'm currently a third year student at the University of Cincinnati, uh, majoring in vocal performance and neuroscience uh, on the neurobiology track. And, yep. Barbara, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. So I'm Barbara Walker. I'm a, an integrative health and performance psychologist within the UC and UC Health, and I also teach at um, at the University of Cincinnati in the psychology department. And I currently teach um, <laughs> sports psychology and positive psychology. And in the medical medical school, um, I co-teach a class called Mind Body Medicine. And I'm Sid Kursla. I'm an ENT, and I got into mindfulness because years ago, students at CCM were not making healthy choices about how to deal with their stress. So um, Rocco Del Vera, who was big at CCM at the time, he's since passed away, but Rocco and I started the first class at CCM, and then I've taught it to med students now. CCM has a lot of courses now at it. So um, the biggest problem is, is they're so busy is getting them to have time to take a class. So Barbara, let me, mindfulness is really popular, you know, and has been for a while. Mm -hmm. but what it is, isn't always understood. So right. what is mindfulness? Well, let's first share that <clears throat> mindfulness has really been around about 2,500 years, right? Um, just originating from really this Eastern meditative tradition. Um, so it's this complex but natural practice. Um, it's cultivated through formal and informal meditations. Um, it's not hypnosis, relaxation, or distraction, and it isn't religious or faith-based. But what it is is really about um, you know observation with, uh, without criticism, it's about being compassionate with yourself. Um, no prescribed feeling is really necessary when you're when you're being mindful, but it allows you to be present and aware and um, really of your current moment. So John Kabat-Zinn um, in 1979 was really the leading person who kind of brought this to our Western culture. And um, he defined mindfulness, which is what I tend to follow. Um, when I'm teaching this, is really about paying attention in a particular way on purpose in the present moment as non-reactively and non-judgmentally and open-heartedly as possible. So that's a mouthful, and we can kind of break that down as we go, but it's um, it's a beautiful way of describing mindfulness. So um, do you have to meditate to do mindfulness? No, you don't. So we can just choose to be mindful every day, right? So you um, meditation is more of a formal process with it, but mindfulness is really you can you can start practicing being mindful while you're walking, right? If you're walking across campus, you could just practice like heel toe. You can do it just with even your normal pace. You could slow your pace down. You can be mindful, like looking at the trees or just listening to the birds or paying attention to particular colors. You can do it while you're brushing your teeth, while you're um, while you're drinking your coffee in the morning. Um, so at any time, you can be more mindful. There's a great book called Mindfulness um, in, um, by Mark Williams and Danny Penman that I use for one of my classes that you see within um, positive psychology. And um, they talk about in the intro of the book that you can double your lifespan using mindfulness because you're really paying attention more in the present moment. We have such a tendency to, to think about past stuff or future stuff. And we're not really present. So really practicing mindfulness allows us to live more in the moment and pay attention. I started using it really um, besides being at UC just with the athletes that I work with because it really is the same thing as this concept of kind of being in the zone or this, this flow state, peak performance state. If you can practice being mindful, um, it allows you to um, to be able to, again, know exactly what you're doing and be really aware of when you're not doing what you want to be doing and kind of pulling it back together to to create the, the moment that you're trying to create. Could you uh, could you discuss a little more the relationship between uh, mindfulness and a flow state? So I I mean, I think it basically is the same thing. I mean, the flow state is when you're feeling this 
um, this nice balance, the centered being of being confident, relaxed, focused, more on autopilot, maybe even linear thinking. Um, you know, when we're outside of that space, um, that's being outside mindfulness too. It's um, maybe on the, you know, on the high stress end, it might be feeling chaotic or your muscles might be tense or you're thinking about the end result or not thinking about the present. And then on the other side is really thinking about, you know, feeling a little down, depressed, kind of distracted. Um, so um, I have this beautiful bell-shaped curve, <laughs> if we could show that. Um, but the idea of like just really being in this nice space is similar to being mindful. I mean, it is being mindful when you're in the zone or in this, this flow state. So when I used to write creatively, I would get in a zone where mm -hmm. um, I didn't, you know, where it was writing itself. Mm -hmm. but, but then I had to go into a critic um, mode in order to edit it. So, right. so one of the things, and we'll talk with Victoria, one of the things that um, is, we've talked about in most of the mind body courses is this getting rid of the inner critic. Mm -hmm. So how does mindfulness relate to that? And what role does, should the inner critic play in our lives? Well, so I think I mean, we're all sort of meant to judge, right? We're kind of wired to judge. We have to discern whether something's threatening or not. So I think part of this with mindfulness is paying attention and giving yourself enough space. And I think about that as being in this flow state too, is giving yourself enough space to be a constructive critic and not a critic critic. So it's not being reactive. It's not being judgmental. So that goes along with the the definition of mindfulness is being non-judgmental, non-reactive. So it's it's allowing you to flow. If we kind of combine those terms, it's flowing through um, mindfully, right? About maybe when you're maybe not even using the word critic, but if when you're discerning what you're trying to create for yourself, and and, and it is a bit of judgment, but it's not a harsh critic judgment, if that makes sense. There's a there's a different level there. Hi, Evans. Well, at least we can see him. <laughs> yeah, I would also like to second that. Um, I think as as a performer and also as a student and a young artist and um, someone who travels in a lot of creative mediums, as, uh, aside from singing as well as writing and drawing, um, I think that uh, there there is this certain a process that you go through as a student of the arts um, in which you are constantly trying to prove upon uh, your previous skill, but also you're trying to create a product of art and you're trying to bring people into the moment. And so, uh, you know, that there is that moment where you have to separate yourself from your lessons or your coachings and when you get into performance mode. And I think it's it's really interesting, especially now when our, you know, our practice rooms double as our recording spaces, as our coaching spaces, and as our lesson spaces. Mm -hmm. It's like creating, um, creating that space within your own mind to kind of separ separate separate uh, the different processes uh, is really, you know, both a challenge and, you know, something to strive towards because mm -hmm. I think it makes your performances you know, especially when they happen um, in your own living space a lot stronger. So what did, Victoria, tell us about the mind-body class and what you learned and how it helped your performance. Yeah, okay, so um, when I took the mind-body class last semester um, with uh, Dr. Sid and also, um, Sterling, um, we really went through um, the idea of mindfulness in practice and in all areas of life. And it was really exciting also because the group was all singers. And so we were kind of able to share in our collective experiences as uh, performance artists and also as linguists and, you know, athletes in a sense. Um, and so we went through different ways of thinking about mindfulness and accessing different um, parts of our consciousness. We talked a lot about uh, 
you know, different reactions of the nervous system, um, how we go through our day to day lives and what we notice, um, what brings us that inner peace, how we set ourselves up for, you know, moments of uh, positive stress and how we how we manage stress outside of uh, those moments when we actually need it. Um, and so we went, we would do a different, we would do a different meditation exercise each week that kind of addressed, um, you know, either emotion, you know, emotional aspects of ourselves, such as like the loving kindness meditation, um, you know, that offer that offers you forgiveness in your own life, or we would, you know, go more somatic, um, and we would kind of go through and really you know, feel physically aware. We also did walking meditations. And so we, so we kind of went through and were able to find awareness um, in both inside of ourselves and outside of ourselves. And as specifically as performers and as athletes, it kind of brought, gave us access to more resources for um, our craft and our daily life. Did you, did it help you deal with stress any? Yes. Yeah, it was one of my favorite things that I looked forward to the most because um, I found a lot of times in online classes, um, it's hard to feel mindful um, in them. Um, and so this was, so this was a place that, you know, what if I would get distracted throughout the day, this was a place that it would center me. And so that, you know, oftentimes we have like a running to do list in our heads. And this was this was a moment where you got to just be present. Um, and I think it it helped because even though it was in the online format, it kind of helped give the idea that you can be mindful even, you know, through through an online forum. And um, I definitely used a lot of the things that we did, like I would. You know, I outside of class, I would journal and write poetry a lot, and we did some journaling and freeform thinking as well as um, do we did some drawing, um, and so I would also use that, and so it all helped to kind of ground me in the world in my out in my current surroundings. So it's hard to practice mindfulness every day on a routine schedule. How do you go go about that? Um, yeah, it is really hard. I think it's it's been a priority for me that um, no matter what, I think you know, especially right now when there's there's an impetus to be productive all the time because you know there's there really isn't much else to do there, and so I would when I find myself of starting to float away from my work and not being able to focus that's when I take the moment to just separate myself from you know whatever task I need to do and just kind of go into myself or outside of myself that's when I, you know you say take a walk or just start journaling or you know listen to music mindfully um, and consume specific music that you want to that's maybe outside of your you know whatever you're studying um or that means sometimes that even means like I try and do one task at once you know because there's a lot of multitasking that happens sometimes that's even finding mindfulness and studying and kind of putting the phone away or taking your distractions away um and so I think there is actually a chance for mindfulness. It's it's mostly about just putting away the distractions. You know, it's, I'll tell a story and and then I want you guys to then I'll ask you for some comments. So I had a patient who hadn't talked for 35 years and because she had a, an injury where she had a car accident and her neck hit the uh, steering wheel and crushed her larynx. So um, we repaired it, we rebuilt the larynx and she was very quiet because you know she was a very quiet person 
uh, both in terms of how she acted and obviously she could only whisper. So when she got her voice back, all of a sudden she became a lot more active and had a lot more things to say and started this organization like the girls got to talk and uh, and became really extroverted. So her personality changed incredibly. Um, so it's always made me think about the relationship between the inner and the outer voice. And we have that in a lot of patients. We have a lot of patients whose inner emotional state will affect their voice. Um, and so they have to become more mindful of their inner emotional state. Um, Evans has, uh, have you, how do you deal with stress in your performers or if they have some emotion that's not healthy? There was a very famous uh, soprano by the name of Birgit Nielsen, who once said, unhappy birds can't sing. Mm. And um, one of my chief jobs in my work with Cincinnati Opera, wherever I work and I'm working with singers, and it's not just singers, it's instrumentalists and conductors and composers as well, is to be sympathetic and empathetic. And I see my job primarily as creating the atmosphere in which artists can flourish. And that's everything from making certain that I'm casting them in a role that is suitable to them, that in the preparation and rehearsal process, I create an atmosphere in the rehearsal room that is conducive to work. Um, I like to say that the drama belongs only on the stage. <laughs> and uh, I work very, very hard, uh, especially if I come into a rehearsal and I see there is tension to figure out where it's coming from. And at a suitable break, pull aside those people that I think are the responsible for that tension. Most often it's the director, frankly. Um, and so what I try and do is have, um, as it were, the uh, a metaphysical crying towel on my shoulder. I've had many, many amazing experiences. I had a, a rehearsal where a, a singer whom I had known for many years was just not making the mustard. Uh, there was something genuinely wrong and they were struggling. And uh, their colleagues didn't understand that. And it was actually a rather tense atmosphere. And I took that singer aside uh, at the break and I said, What's up? What's up? To learn that they had been to the doctor the afternoon before and had a terrible diagnosis uh, of a really serious disease, that they didn't know they had anything. Uh, that it was just a routine uh, physical checkup, and they were so mm -hmm. rattled emotionally that it affected their ability, not necessarily to phonate, but to concentrate. <clears throat> so my job, I see, as primarily to be the resident as it were, not amateur psychotherapists, that's it. That's disrespectful to psychotherapists. But the resident um, broad shoulders to shoulder and try and help singers achieve their best. And sometimes that's as simple in pre-COVID days of come to my office and let's have a cup of coffee together. Let's just sit, two of us. Let's talk about it. Because quite often it is, a, it is something that is easily resolved. Uh, maybe someone isn't as prepared as they'd like to be, or maybe there was something that happened in a rehearsal in which I was not present that really upset them, or it's something in their life outside of the rehearsal room. I think, you know, Victoria, you, uh, you hit the nail on the head. Um, your equilibrium as a singer is probably more delicate than in any other performer because your instrument is in your throat. You now, if you've got the flu, you can still play the piano. Um, and if you've got a mm -hmm. sore throat, you can still conduct an orchestra. And if you've got a migraine headache, well, maybe that puts everybody down. But if you're out of sorts, you can still sit down at your composing desk and compose. Singers have to be aligned in every way imaginable in order to do their work well. So I see it. I have to say, I'm happy to say, I don't see it as often as I could because I think the general atmosphere at Cincinnati Opera, at least, is something that we say from the very first rehearsal, which is we're here to support you and create an environment in which you can do your best. And if singers hear that at the very first day, and I think there's there's one other thing that I know it's a little bit of um, 
conjecture. But I know many opera companies where, for example, uh, the singers, well, the whole cr creative team as well, meets the producer maybe on the first day. Uh, I might show up to the you know the first rehearsal or something, and then they are absent. They don't come back to the dress rehearsal or the room run or some late technical rehearsal and start making all sorts of criticisms like, well, that's not right. And, and you shouldn't be doing that. And why did you stage that that way? I'm at every rehearsal, maybe some days only for 10 minutes, but I'm at every rehearsal because I think taking the temperature of the way that a production is progressing is, is benefits the mental health of the performers to know that, as it were, the boss is always watching now. That has its negative side as well, because sometimes when I come into the room and I don't notice it, but people tell me the room changes. People are a little bit more on their toes, maybe a little bit more on edge, which I think is silly, but um, look, that's human psychology. But I think the positive side of it is that singers know that I'm always there and they uh, and I am watching the process. And so if they come to me with a problem, they come to me with a problem that I'll have a better chance of understanding because I've been around the the process really interesting um, well, I, I was going to say evans i think it's really important too i know you missed the, the beginning of this but um for you to be as mindful i mean you obviously practice this and so you being mindful is helping the entire organization because you if you are not mindful and centered yourself you wouldn't even be able to pick all that up so and then announcing that you do um with the um, performance from the very beginning. I mean, it does set a tone of we care about you, right? We, yeah. we have an excellent organization. We care about you and we want to know and you're kind of picking up when you see something going wrong. And so I think it's beautiful. It's great. Well, I think it's vital. I think you lead by example. And as the English say, you begin as you mean to continue. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm very fortunate because that that sort of atmosphere was was promulgated by my chief executive now retired Patricia Beggs. Um, especially, um, especially after the at, at the beginning of my tenure, uh, the artistic director who preceded me had a very different working manner, and the artistic director who preceded him had a very different working manner. Mm -hmm. Patty saw the opportunity when I came on board of, of as it were, making a shift uh, in the in as it were in the karma of how we relate to singers, and it's paying off. Really. That's great. Do you have any other comments, Barbara, on what we've been talking about? No, I mean, I think that um, I like that you asked that combination of what the, you know, with flow and um, and mindfulness, I think they go hand in hand. Um, so, and I think that, um, and, you know, with the, all the athletes that I've worked with, the business executives, the performing artists, it's all the same, right? It's all, and I like that you said that when you were talking about the voice, the voice is, it's so it, it, that it it is so sensitive. It's uh, the same thing with equestrian athletes, or the same thing with um, golfers, right? It's such a fine motor skill sport. Same thing for for voice. I mean, it gets uh, it gets picked up so quickly, or changes so quickly if there's a stressor going on. So, you know, some of that, and and this is all when you're talking about high performers, they're pretty disciplined people to begin with, but it does take all these pieces of making sure that you're you know getting good sleep, you're eating well, you're sleeping well. Um, I already said that twice, but <laughs> if you need it again, because people are not sleeping well, um, you know, working out, exercising and connecting with other people to be able to make that happen to begin with. So, yeah, it's super exciting how the mindfulness and the flow piece fits together. So, yeah. Victoria, were you taught any of these breathing techniques or anything in your classes? <clears throat> um. Yes, um, my studio class, um, one of my studio professors um, is Professor Amy Johnson. Um, and okay. so she, she's been one of the spear, spearheaders um, in the mind body class for CCM. Um, and so between her and um, my personal voice teacher, um, Karen Likes, um, we often go through and center ourselves and, um, you know, there especially recently, there's been a really uh, big impetus in my own personal lessons about grounding myself in in my body. And, you know, um, and I think that that kind of kind of relates to, you know, breathing exercises and also the way that you carry yourself outside of outside of lessons as well. And so I we also um, 
alongside breathing exercises, we, I would have a lot of discussions about um, even just how I carry myself and how I walk outside of, you know, performance spaces and how I center my breath and my alignment, even, you know, outside of performance, because it's like, you know, the life, the life that you live on in those few moments on stage are very much reflective of, you know, the way that you live your life off stage. So, you know, that if that means carrying a rolly backpack so that you can really feel, the, you know, the expansion and, you know, talking about, you know, taking mindful, you know, walks and runs and, um, and making sure that every breath is grounded. Um, we've done a lot of that and a lot of engagement. Victoria, may I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. um, do you think that beginning, uh, let's say your average staging rehearsal, it's more difficult in the theater because there's so many people involved and it's very expensive, but let's say room rehearsals for an opera. Do you think the beginning every rehearsal with even five minutes of breathing exercises for the whole cast, everybody just sort of takes a seat or a seat on the floor and someone leads the, the entire room in just five minutes of breathing, sort of to set the mood. What would you think about that? Yes, <laughs> I'll, just, <laughs> I'll say yes on that. Um, recently, um, in one of our um, undergraduate opera productions, uh, we partnered with our movement specialist, um, Susan Mo Mosier, and we would actually do that um, at the beginning of every staging rehearsal, we would, and alongside um, Professor Johnson and Professor Shaw, we would we would go through and we would, um, first of all, we would you know go through intimacy training before even beginning mm. um, any any sort of um, you know part partner because we had a lot of lifts and a lot you know a lot of interaction amongst the ensemble. Um, in in our 2000 February 2020 production, um, and so we would we would go through and we'd do these kinds of group activities of, you know, physicalizing and going in circle, going in a circle, and getting our breaths aligned through active activities and and through mm -hmm. varying um, flow flow states of like fast or the slow. And I mean the way that it changed the process. Um, was astounding because we really made sure, especially in ensemble work. Um, okay. I mean, it's you know, it's the same idea of a choir, you know, choir warm ups and get it, getting everyone's breath aligned. I think you know, yeah. even even if you're not singing in the staging rehearsal, uh, when you have a combined physical language and you know, it, the the breath can inform the emotion, which is something we talked about a lot. Thank you. I think it would be a great idea. Um, we have one or two minutes left. Anybody have any final comments? No, but I'm taking away from this meeting something that may be a radical shift uh, for Cincinnati Opera in thinking about, especially this summer when we are dealing with such a strange environment where we can't do so much of what we normally do is that maybe we're going to start every rehearsal with some mindfulness. Yeah, we have a great, we have a great like three to four minute meditation that we use for our class that I can send to you if you're would interested. You said, uh, I would be very grateful for that. This is just, this has really got my mind rolling. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. Well, that was the purpose. That's great. <laughs> well, thank you everybody so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having you us. Have, yeah. a great thank mindful, you. have a great mindful day. Hello, I'm Evans Mirages, the Harry T. Wilkes Artistic Director for Cincinnati Opera. I've attended many World Voice Days in the last 12 or 13 years, and I've always been impressed by the caliber of discourse that happens during these wonderful events about vocal health, about preservation of the voice, and it has been no more important than in this past year and a half to talk about the preservation and restoration of the singing voice. Specifically, of course, for me, the operatic singing voice. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what I think my job will be this summer 
as Cincinnati Opera performs again in public for the first time since March of a year and a half ago. We gave our last public performance as an opera rep uh, just before the shutdown. We were going to do a wonderful production last summer of Dvorak's masterpiece opera, Urzalka. It is his last opera, written in 1901, and it is the one opera that carries his name around the world as an opera composer. We put together a program called Bohemian Rhapsody, in which we examined some of Dvorak's other music to give you a sense of his style as an opera composer. And of course, as part of that program, we had some Dvorak vocal music, sung beautifully by mezzo-soprano Maria Miller. And that was the last live music we produced, until what will be the first live music we do, again, this July the 11th, part of our free outdoor concert, uh, part of our summer at Summit. It's the Washington Park concert that for this year has moved north. So what do I anticipate from all of these singers for these three major casts of productions of The Barber of Seville and Carmen and Tosca? For many of them, this will be the first time they have sung in public before a paying audience since a year ago in March. Some of them have found work here and there in Europe, and of course many of them, and you will know many of them if you've been a fan of Cincinnati Opera, because you will have seen them in things we call apartment arias. In the worst beginning days of the pandemic, people in their own homes recorded arias for us so that we could share them with our public. But that's a lot different than singing in front of thousands of people, amplified or unamplified. So I look to this summer for inspiration, of course, from this art form that has inspired me since I was a teenager. But also I realize I have a particular job to do this summer, which is to reassure singers that it's all still there. In many conversations with some of the most amazing artists that we'll have for this summer, I've noticed a sense of hesitation, a sense of fear, actually, that will I still have it? Will I still be able to sing the way I sang before the pandemic? especially if it's a singer who hasn't had a regular operatic engagement in a big opera house without amplification. So part of my job this summer will be a glorified, as it were, vocal psychiatrist. I'm not a voice expert. I rely on those wonderful ENTs, of course, especially headed by Dr. Sid Kosler and the incredible team at UC Health. But equally important to my job as an artistic director is artistic paterfamilias, as you will. Singers, of course, are nervous around me sometimes because I'm the fellow who hires them. And so if they're not at their best, will I think twice about hiring them again? It's not happened very often in my career, thankfully. But they're going to be nervous anyway because they will have not sung a note in public, many of them, since a year and a half ago. And a couple of other things will be in play as well because we are going to perform this summer out of doors, which means that everything is going to be sound reinforced. Mind you, I didn't say amplified because that's another thing I'd like to share with you about my thinking about how we're going to engage with our singers for this summer. We, because we're going to be in this enormous city park that in non-COVID times can sit tens of thousands of people, will still be in that large oval space if you've been to Summit Park in Blue Ash, where people will be gathering in about groups of 1,500. But that field stretches hundreds of feet to the rear of the oval and so we have to reinforce the voices with very sophisticated sound design and sound reinforcement. Every singer will be wearing a microphone. All the chorus will be amplified, as well as the wonderful members of the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra. So you sing differently when you have a microphone on you than you do if you're simply trying to fill a music hall, but you still have to produce your voice with the same sort of operatic fervor and your training and the way you hold your diaphragm and the way you project your voice as if you were singing unamplified. It's a bit of a tricky business, I'll say, because it's not like making a recording. I don't know if any of you have ever been in a recording session as singers, but you don't have to project in a recording studio. As a matter of fact, it gives you an opportunity to do things intimately with the microphone, as it were, as your uh, transmitter, than if you're trying to fill a hole naturally. You can sing more softly, of course. You can move closer to the microphone for special effects or farther away for other ones. That's not the same as singing with a microphone that amplifies your entire voice and with an orchestra. It's a little bit different. 
And we're going to rely on an amazing sound designer to find just that right combination of reinforcement and amplification so that the voices stand out and blend at the same time and are joined by the Great Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra. And it all sounds as close to indoors as it were out of doors. But that requires a special concentration on the part of the singer because singers need to understand that though they're projecting their voices, they're not having to fill the house. And so one of the things I'm going to be encouraging the singers this summer, especially, is to, uh, as it were, as they say, festina lente in Italian, make haste slowly. Use your voice, but know that you don't have to push. So I'm going to have a very interesting job this summer working with our wonderful singers, asking them to produce the kind of sound they would normally produce in an unamplified setting, but pulled back just a little bit so that they can preserve their voices and sing with the beauty of their sound in this unusual setting. I'm looking forward to this summer of Cincinnati Opera. It's going to be an unusual one. We're not going to be singing the way we normally would in music hall, but we will be singing, and I hope you'll be there. Rebecca Howell here, one last time. I am truly honored and blessed with the opportunity to have welcomed you back. We learned about how to care, protect, and celebrate your voice through a series of lectures from Cincinnati voice lovers. We listened to experts on mind, body, and the impacts on our vocal health. And, and I would be remiss to not mention the effects that George Floyd's death has had on our community, both locally and nationally. Let us use this as a challenge in moving forward. Here at the University of Cincinnati, we celebrate our differences and like the rest of our country, are challenged to be better, to open our eyes and warm our hearts to our differences. In the legacy of Robin Cotton, an esteemed international surgeon and entrepreneur in pediatric airway reconstruction and in loving memory of Rocco Del Vera, an internationally renowned leader in diversity and advocacy for performance voice, the Robin T. Cotton and Rocco Del Vera Professional Voice Swelling and Airway Fund was created to allow us to continue the work, community outreach, education, and the clinical translation on basic science research for the Division of Laryngology. Your gift affords this mission. As in years past, we at UC Health are excited to again offer voice screenings to our greater Cincinnati community. Please remember, if you are having trouble with your voice, please see us in the office. We are here and at your service as a medical provider. If on the other hand, you are feeling good, but your curiosity has been piqued by this presentation, please sign up for a vocal screen to see your beautiful instrument in action. Finally, thank you all for joining us and listening. We have enjoyed performances by bass baritone Christian Purcell and soprano Victoria Okafor for this wonderful sponsoring with the Cincinnati Opera. Thank you to Evans and his team. Thank you to my University of Cincinnati team, especially Angie Keith and Sue Miller for all their help in making our dream a reality. We hope to see you in person next year. We are one world, many voices.